Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. Thank you so much for joining us today, where we are covering chapters 41 through 44 of Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros. But as always, before we begin this deep dive, please, please listen closely to our content warning. Most importantly, we include spoilers for all of Iron Flame. We may be focusing on chapters 41 through 44 today, but we bring in insights from the whole book, which means every Everything from Iron Flame, Fourth Wing, and of course anything else Rebecca Yaros has said, it's all up for discussion. So if you don't know why we almost turned today's episode into a cat is being insufferable drinking game, but then decided that was a bad idea because we'd be dead, then please go finish the book and then come back here when you are done. Next up, this podcast is rated R. We of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things with adult words about an adult book. We get the word foursome twice in this stretch of chapters. There's nothing spicy about it. That's because there's nothing fucking spicy in any of these sets of chapters. I'm sure we'll think of something though, so please be mindful of little listening ears. Last thing before we jump into our Iron Flame episode 8. If you love fantasy fangirls and you want to support us in making this dream our livelihood, if you want more content, more community connection, discounts on merch, early access to episodes, and more, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, Cadets and Dragon Riders, and our Patreon community is so freaking incredible. I I am deep, deep in theory land for Crescent City. So it's not just Iron Flame stuff that we have on their Discord for our Patreon members, but I have been deep, deep in theory land with all of our fellow Crescent City readers. And let me tell you, it's the only thing sustaining me until January 30th right now. So thanks, shouts to you all for keeping me sane. For those of you like me who have not finished Crescent City or Crescent City 2, it's still a safe place to be at. We are very strict about where spoilers go. So you can go into forms that you do want spoilers. And if you don't want spoilers, then you can stay out of those too. So I am safe when I go into our Discord from spoilers. Thank you to our community moderators for making sure that it's true. So if you want access to that Discord channel and all of the other Patreon perks, the link is in the show notes or YouTube captions. And really and truly, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us bring these episodes to you. And now it is time to hike the cliffs of Draylor. Yay! <laughs> Actually, it's time to go to Takaris' house. That's way more fun. <laughs> yeah, that is a lot. Let's go find a Venon. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Nicole. Well, let's begin this episode deep dive with Battle Brief, a.k.a. Nicole's summary of what happens in chapters 41 through 44 of Iron Flame. Chapter 41. Zayden is pissed as he leads our Soaring Gale crew through Viscount Takaris' house, giving them a small tour of this place that he's frequented many a time. Then he introduces them all to the Viscount. And this dude knows how to make some peeps feel welcome. Brennan is ready to dive into some negotiation tactics, but Viscount is like, oh no, we need to play dress up first sir and who is the best person to help them out but god fucking damn it cat oh that's why zayden's been here so much cat leads them up to get dressed and zayden and violet start arguing that's gonna be a theme throughout this chapter zayden is terrified and pissed at her for putting her life at risk violet is infuriated that zayden is putting protecting her over common sense for the fucking revolution and she ends the argument with the final knife twist you sound like dane woof Sorry, X-Man, but you really deserved this one. The Soaring Gale ladies get dressed in gorgeous black gowns and don't worry, Miras has pockets. Huzzah! Pockets deserve huzzahs, okay? They do, absolutely. <laughs> Kat comes back from putting on her own red outfit and continues to absolutely fuck with Violet's mind. But Serena comes in to put her little sister in her place. The four ladies head down to the dining room and Violet can't help but notice she feels off and jealous. But in a true, shall I get the wing leader moment, Zaddy bursts through her mental shields and reminds her just how not jealous she needs to be. In this 50 person dining room, 50 people are in this dining room. Zayden and Violet have a moment of apologizing to each other and and then they make out. I can almost see the looks of awkwardness on these other 50 guests. Viscount Takaris breaks up this lovebird moment and directs Violet onto the terrace. It's time to see our girl wield. He wants her to go out into his private arena and strike the Ribasan chest, the priceless chest Fen Ryerson brought to Cars when he made the deal for Zayden and Kat to wed. Not a good look for our guy Fen Ryerson right now. Violet heads down to the field with Mira and panics. Now would be a really good time to know how to aim with her wielding. But the guards open the chest and out. Pops a 
Brennan, chapter 44, Rutro. Violet, Mira, and a I decided to join in for the fun. Brennan face off with a starving dark wielder. And it's off to a great start with Mira basically giving him a fucking knife. Just as he begins to drain from the earth, however, the three Sorengales huddle together and Mira doing the absolute impossible shields them all even though she is far from outside her range of the wards. We will be discussing this at length later. Violet sees her opportunity and tells Brennan and a knocked out Mira to get off the grass. Shouts to my Princess Diaries fans out there. Violet unleashes her lightning on a water-soaked ground just as Taryn picks her up, thus creating one crispy venom. Ding dong, the venom's dead. Glad the dramatics are over. Except Zayden has Viscount Takaris in a literal suspended chokehold. Not the kind of choking we're used to seeing from our shadow daddy. Violet talks him off the I'm about to kill Takaris ledge and the Viscount apologizes for his stupidity. Then looks at Zayden in a what now manner. Now they negotiate. An hour later, a changed and fed Violet and Zayden, honestly, that would make me happy too, are sitting down with Takaris and Takaris presents Violet with his offer. Violet stays here and defends Corden against the riderless wyvern who have been flying around like gnats. In exchange, a few years later, she'll be able to live out her days with everyone she loves in the Isle Kingdoms. Those damn Isle Kingdoms rear their ugly heads once again. Violet says, no, although it's tempting, it is the coward's way out. So instead, Takaris says, well, fine, you can just take the hundred griffin flyers to Erasia and we'll have a deal with the luminary, meaning Kat is now going to be Violet's housemate. Brennan agrees. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter 43. Time for a hike. The Griffin Flyers and the Dragon Riders are told that they're going to be climbing up a 12,000 foot cliff that was slash is probably booby trapped in hopes that they'll start liking each other more. I don't know if I like anyone after hiking 12 hours, but that's just me. But as the Dragon Riders start to bitch and moan about this, Serena reminds them that the Flyers are basically putting their Griffins and therefore themselves on the brink of death with this elevation and the treacherous nature of this hike. So they begin. Three hours in, it still sucks. Violet Sloan and Mirren, a griffin flyer and Kat's best friend, are having a delightful chat. They learn that the Cliffsbane cadets have something called harvest instead of threshing, where they basically run off a cliff in hopes of landing on a griffin, and if they don't, they fall to their bloody death getting ripped apart by the wind. Oh, no. They just swim ashore, brush off the embarrassment, and join a different military branch. Weird. But then a pulsating, nice, wave rushes over all of them, and it turns out a baby dragon just emerged in the Eurasian Veil. Happy birthday, Feathertail! Several more hours later, Violet is ready for Malik to claim her at any moment, so she doesn't have to hike anymore. I would also be this dramatic after 12,000 feet of hiking. They approach a section where Dane is standing guard. Apparently there's a booby trap, and cadets have to jump over the six feet across and land on the other side of the pressure point. Sounds great, except Luella and Violet are too short to make the crossing. So Violet, using Riddick's rock climber abilities, has him put a sword on the cliff face and makes them swing across. And now this is the gauntlet. Violet crosses, no problem, but Luella hits the pressure point and all hell breaks loose. Riddick gets pierced with two arrows. Violet's shoulder pops out of socket trying to save Luella as she falls off the cliff's edge. Luella, however, cannot hang on and she falls to her death and Luella's griffin <laughs> dies as a result. Can someone for the love of God get Brennan, please? Chapter 44. Dane pops Violet's shoulder back into its socket. Woof. And Kat goes absolutely unhinged on Violet, screaming that Violet dropped Luella on purpose. Brennan arrives and starts to mend Riddick, but just just when we thought the worst was over, a giant gray set of wings beats by them and a moss snatches Sibylair, Luella's dying griffin, off the cliff. Wyvern! Violet races onto Taryn's back, much to Dane's dismay. Hey, I remember this feeling. Violet and Taryn move through the sky and get the wyvern into position and Violet, with a newly popped back in its socket shoulder, wields lightning downward onto the wyvern, using the wyvern's magic as an energy field to attract the lightning. The four wyvern drop out of the sky like sacks of stupid gray potatoes, but as Violet lands on the top of the cliff, somehow still standing, she, Brennan, and Bodhi realize something horrific. The newest hatchling's magic pulse, nice, alerted the wyvern to where they are and also alerted the venom who created those wyverns since they all share one conscious. Well, shit, but the most shocking thing of the day is that they realize this from a book that Brennan has on the venom that he won't let Violet read. God 
fucking damn it, Brennan. I love your battle briefs so much. And I'm so excited that we get to experience poor meal and this other culture. In fact, did you know that one in five Americans have learned a new language on their bucket list? If you're like, hey, that's me for 2024, listen up. Because Babbel is a fantastic language learning app that makes this goal a reality. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Our dad has actually been a Babbel super user for over a year now, and he has loved being able to put his Italian language skills to use when they were in Italy this past September. So ordering food, asking for directions, you know, those daily interactions that you simply have out in the world. He was so proud of himself for being able to initiate conversation in Italian. And hey, I'm really proud of him too. And fun fact, Lexi, I'm actually currently learning Italian in prep for my honeymoon next year. And I love that Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in in real life situations and delivered with conversation based teaching. So you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. I have terrible pronunciation. I think we all know that. Or maybe actually you don't because Nicole edits my embarrassments out as much as she can. But it's been a real issue with my Spanish over the years. But Babbel has speech recognition technology that helps me improve my pronunciation and accent. Where was this when I studied abroad in college? (laughs) Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for Fantasy Fangirls listeners at babbel.com slash FF. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash FF, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash FF. Rules and restrictions may apply. Let's don our signet power and discuss key insights, foreshadowing, and of course, all of our favorites, theories from chapters 41 through 44. This maybe is not so much a theory as it is an observation because Zayden has a bad story stretch in this first stretch of chapters. Dude, would it have killed you to talk to her about your connection to Takaris? Not knowing about him, his frequenting the house, all of the history between him and Kat and their betrothal, I would have been so pissed if I was Violet and felt this blindsided. Yes, he didn't want her to come. Yes, she still came and blindsided him. But like, he could have been way more upfront about, because like, it would have been one thing to just be like, oh, well, this is just us talking about our exes. This is not. This is everything connected in this war. I'm a little pissed at Zayden from this stretch. Me too. And you know, I can usually defend the way that Zayden withholds it information, which we've talked a lot about, especially in the first few episodes of this Iron Fling deep dive, because he is like a CIA agent who can't and shouldn't share everything he does, even with Violet. And in most cases, he and Violet, they really haven't had time to talk about things that she gets upset over with him. Like when she was upset, he didn't tell her earlier about Cap from the Griffin Flyer rendezvous. I was very much like, now Violet, when would your exes have come up in conversation? It's not fair to be mad at him about any bitty bit of information you didn't previously know simply because it hasn't come up yet. However, oh dear, this is a different situation. And I absolutely cannot defend you, Zayden, because exactly what you were saying, Nicole, he has been withholding additional reasons why going to Dakar's for the Luminary isn't an option. I don't believe that Kat is the main reason. She certainly is part of it, but it's not the main reason. He didn't even know that she would be here. But yeah, dude, Zayden, the heir to poor meal and one person with the luminary being the same guy you broke off a betrothal with his niece to? That would have been some extremely helpful information and context. And you had every opportunity to share this information with Violet when she pressed you over and over and over again. Whew, I'm getting a little heated here. Damn it, Zayden. Why Why did you do this? Or actually, why didn't you do this? Why did you not give her this extra context? Well, and correct me if I'm wrong. They haven't had the, I will no longer withhold information that'll influence your decisions, right? Have they had that conversation or that promise to each other yet? I feel like that's been the whole, yeah, that's been a whole theme throughout the entire book and the end of, or kind of the end of Fourth Wing going into this. If it hasn't been outright said, then it absolutely has been implied multiple times. I think they outright say it coming up because it should have, like you said, it should have been said way sooner. I just gonna really hang Zayden out to dry here for a second. At the end of last chapter, Zayden says, you aren't where I left you, violence, which is just not a good look. And Violet says back to that, like I'm some kind of pet who should stay curled up on your bed because you said so. To which Zayden replies, quote, the thought isn't entirely unpleasant. Woof, Zayden. 
woof, dude. I couldn't believe this when I first read this. Like, my mouth was on the floor, and all I could think is how much he's acting like another MMC in a fantasy series that no one wants to be compared to. If you know, you know. Now, Zayden, he will, of course, redeem himself pretty quickly and not only apologize, but also accept fault and adjust his actions. Good for you, buddy. Which is why we felt so much anger toward Dane and Fourth Wing. Yes, there was, of course, the memory stealing bit, but the way that he acknowledged that Dane heard Violet's requests but then again and again stuck to his well I know better tactics is what really rubbed Nicole and I and a lot of the fandom the wrong way so as painful as it is to see Zayden in this light we also really do see the comparison between how he responds to Violet giving him the don't protect me talk versus what we saw with Dane all last book but I'm gonna admit something here this short stretch of Major L's took his selfish nature in protecting Violet that's been subtle and not so subtle throughout Iron Flame and he just displays it front and center here because of this I really do struggle to give Zayden my number one book boyfriend spot because I and I really do prefer him in fourth wing versus iron flame mostly because of how he acts in this chapter I mean don't get me wrong I am pissed at Zayden for his actions in this chapter and I don't know if I can give him my number one spot because it belongs to another and I don't know if I can give that up I just truly don't I do love him a lot more in iron flame and I know I'm kind of in the minority with that at least from what I've seen on social media I just really enjoy after he does his switch it at the end of this Takaris visit after he does the switch and just like how he makes her a partner going forward just we're gonna overlook chapter 56 for a second but like how he makes her a partner going forward and especially after she learns about him being an intrinsic like I just I don't again I do not think I can give him my number one book boyfriend spot because that I I can't I just I can't do that but it's up there he's up there (laughs) yeah I'm not saying he's not up there he absolutely is but I just think that he lost any opportunity for the number one spot because of this stretch of chapters here for me and I will say also Violet essentially agrees with me that she also preferred fourth wing Zayden because she notes how she misses when he wanted to kill her instead of how he acts now towards her when he's in love can we just hear that sentence one more time like she prefers (laughs) how he wanted like Violet, that says a lot about you, (laughs) girl. Like, oh my God, I can't. Oh, that that kills me. We need to talk about the descriptions of this insanely cool house because describing this, I can't even say house, it's a palace basically with these large glass double doors, quote, how utterly impractical and sublimely gorgeous. She uses similar language around how they dress for dinner. And I do agree with Violet on this one. I am a bra off leggings, big sweatshirt at dinner kind of a girl, at least at my own house. And while Zayden and Brennan are fighting about rank, Mira says, quote, they grow grass ornamentally. We need to remember that these people grew up in a brutal and practical nature at Best Guy. There was no decoration. Like imagine if you've been living somewhere that has never been decorated extravagantly. Yes, they have statues of the first six. Yes, in their rooms, they can have a blanket that's black and that's them expressing their personality or books or whatever. But there have always just been these little teeny tiny touches throughout Fourth Wing and Iron Flame about their military rooms, blankets, books, equipments, and their armoire, so on and so forth. It's never been extravagant. It's never been for pleasing to the eye-ness. It's always just been practical. It was even a really big deal for Violet to see art and tapestries on the walls at Ryerson House. And then that's nothing compared to this great grandeur this palace and also again I need to see the fan art nobody has tagged us quite yet at least that I've seen and I still need my cordon fan art please and thank you I'm desperate please 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 tag us I want you to imagine that's where you're coming from and then you walk into a literal glass fucking palace like this would be an entirely different experience I don't blame Mira for being like they grow grass ornamentally like again I know I mentioned this in battle brief but it just reminds me of the get off the grass like in princess diaries like it just kills me that connection but ironically in Violet's inner jealous monologue later she reflects on how she never gets jealous over something as shallow as appearance how they fight how they ride absolutely that's something she gets jealous over but the practical things are the things that she gets jealous over not not the ornamental. Quote, being pretty doesn't save you at Bezgayeth. It just ties all of that in so beautifully. I love how you pointed that out, Nicole. That's such a good point because exactly, beauty, it doesn't save you as a person in the writer's quadrant or in a palace that probably could use some real defending. 
that's why they're trying to get Violet there. <laughs> they're like, we're fucked. Can you lightning? <laughs> like, we need some help. I'm totally taking a hard pivot, but I would give anything for some kind of POV or even a fanfic or whatever of Zayden getting drunk and falling into Takaris's pool. Please someone write that fanfic. <laughs> and if you already have, send it our way. Fantasyfangirlspod at gmail.com. I want to see this. Although that probably also means that he would be with Kat and then we'd have to deal with Kat and Zayden together. I, I almost need some Kat and Zayden fanfic just to understand the like, I hate you, but I want to bang you side of their relationship. And I'm not going to lie. I'm nervous that if I read it, though, that I'm going to like her more because that <laughs> would happen in my brain. Speaking of people who I, I, I don't know if I like or hate. I, I really don't. And this is Viscount Takaris. In his descriptions, he has rings on his hands that twinkle with heavy gemstones. In episode one of Iron Flame, a note about one of the assembly members, Surrey, having a giant emerald ring really stood out to me. And this is the only other mention of gemstones that I've come across, at least in, in this deep dive reread. read. Could they be connected? We don't know. She is a dragon rider, so she's not from Poor Emil, but is she? I just, I don't know. I don't know how that would work, but those emerald rings and the rings that twinkle, these gemstones are standing out to me. They could just both be wearing rings. It could just be nothing, but I really just, I'm reading in between the lines right now. <laughs> All right, Lex, GFDC, are you ready for God fucking damn it, cat? Oh gosh, I suppose. Where's my mimosa? <laughs> just everything that Cat says in this stretch. I'm just going to pull out a few of the moments that she has when she's like oh don't worry Zayden we kept your room the same like I'm impressed Violet didn't punch her I'm not gonna say that I would inflict violence on another human being as I'm literally wearing a sweatshirt that says violent little thing but I'm <laughs> I'm surprised that Violet didn't punch her do you think however that Violet and Zayden's anger at each other is prompted at all by Kat or do you think that this is just all Zayden and Violet. I'm leaning towards Zayden and Violet. But Violet raises her voice very rapidly and says, stop keeping me safe. And she instantly regrets it. But then that also raises the question, do Kat's powers work on Zayden also? They're speaking mind to mind right now. So their shields are down, they meaning Zayden and Violet. But also later, Zayden like throws up a shield of shadows and cuts cat off it might just be from surprising her and that's what cuts her I just I don't understand I can help you with that here I, at least me. I think so like there's yeah so so it's never explicitly said so this is really just reading through all of the descriptions that we receive I don't think shields work the same way against Griffin Flyer's mind work because Violet confirmed that her shields were up when they arrived back at the beginning of chapter 40 and the Griffin Flyer could still tell that she was telling the truth upon their arrival plus later on in this stretch Takaris can see her desire to protect the people she loves. This is also why Zanian gives Violet the dagger with runes to fight against Kat's gift of heightening emotions. He knows that she's got great shields, but Kat can still penetrate through those shields. In fact, Violet is like really horrified that she's able to. She can block Zayden out, but she can't keep Kat out. So I believe that that right there is confirmation. The Griffin Flyer's mind work does still work even when Dragon Rider's shields are in place there. And then on that note, don't quote me on this, but I think that there is a difference between Zayden and Violet's mind to mind ability to speak and quote unquote sneak each other in even when they have their shields up. And then when Zayden uses his intensic signet, that's when he has to lower his shields. I feel oh. like there's some inconsistencies, but that's my understanding is that yes, like they can still keep their shields up to like block each other out, but the way that their mind to mind works, it's a little bit different from the signet shield. Is there a part. separate shield for the like onyx shadows in her mind in the archives? I think so. Yeah, oh, that's like okay. very targeting him out versus I'll say walls out from everybody. I need a visual aid on how shields work or like just I do think that she's maybe not confirmed but I do think she's hinted that we are going to learn a lot more about mind signet specifically in the intrinsic signet in book three so I'm really hoping we get some more confirmation on how these work because for me right now it's just I'm getting confused on how the magic is landing which is not abnormal for me in fantasy novels I do get very in the weeds and sometimes overthink things and then confuse myself. I'm looking at you, Crescent <laughs> City. <laughs> so to answer your earlier question, no, I don't think Kat's powers work on Zayden because he's got to have that same ruin on his person. Otherwise, gosh, she'd be doing everything to retrieve a lustful emotion and then just 
full-blown amplify it. Ultimately, I do believe that this is Violet and Zayden being just really pissed off at each other because honestly, Violet has every right to be furious. And while I defend our girl Violet and appreciate the character art she is on and her stumbles along the way, usually she does not have every right to be as mad as she is with Zayden. Except now. Now, I actually will say she's not mad enough for long enough. I'm really mad at Zayden. <laughs> I'm going back to my fanfic of Zayden at Takaris' house with Kat. Like, I bet you anything before he had a rune or something like that, she would use that on him all the fucking time. And I just, I need it. I need it in my hands. I need to read it. <laughs> Speaking of Violet, she takes matters into her own fucking hands. So Zayden continues to just be a dickwad and a half with talking to Kat about Violet. As if Violet was wasn't fucking standing there herself and Violet finally snaps with a Violet can handle herself and I feel like this guy just completely forgot how powerful and trained she is like she she has bonded two dragons she has one of the most powerful signets to the point where they're saying Zayden is not the most powerful writer of their generation anymore it might as it might be Violet instead and he is being you know what He's being a fucking alpha hole, Lexi. Such an alpha hole. <laughs> I texted Nicole this. I was like, oh, geez. Zayden's being such an alpha hole, which again, it's a Crescent City reference. We're sorry. We are super deep in Crescent City right now. We're it's not. Pull, it's pull no spoiler. No spoiler. No, no spoilers. We promise. But I texted Nicole and I was like, geez, Zayden's being such an alpha hole. And she's like, oh my gosh, I already have that in the outline. It's like, of course, because we have the same mind. Because <laughs> yes, and that is going to just be a new nickname that I give anyone who is doing exactly what Zayden is doing right now. You are being an alpha hole 100 percent. i'm gonna use that in the real world and then just it, enjoy the stairs of confusion but then violet comes back at him with the perfect clap back like violet is really good at being sassy but this is to a whole nother level when she says you sound like dane oh <laughs> snap between the assembly saying you brought us atos and scribes last episode <laughs> and violet using dane as the measuring stick to absolutely annihilate zayden with dane is just getting the floor wiped with this name right now this whole book he is like remember back on conscription day where they're just like he's just the poking oh my gosh like they were all just like back on conscription day we were even commenting about how zayden would never ever tolerate like the shit that his squad is giving him like I don't feel bad for Dane because no. he had all of it coming to him. But man, bad, poor Dane. Kind of, not like actually poor Dane, but poor Dane. <laughs> I will say like later on as we get into the hikes and the cliffs of Draylor and all this kind of stuff, like it's not really my favorite stretch of chapters in this book, but Dane's almost comedic relief is really delicious and it makes up for a lot of my Dane hatred. I'm not going to lie. But we need to take a moment of spotlight appreciation for Violet's dress and I'm going to describe it because it is a deep V. It is made of woven black leaves about the size of her palm or smaller. It is fully backless so you can see all of her dragon relic. It has many, many, many layers of Devarelli silk from the Isle Kingdoms and I want to wear this impractically beautiful dress so fucking bad. Like I am not an extravagant dresser if you can't tell from our YouTube watchers. I'm normally wearing a crew neck sweatshirt and that's just my life but I would wear this in a fucking heartbeat. Oh, me too. I am so excited for whenever there's like one of those fantasy balls, which I really hope we get invited to. If anyone has those invitations floating around, please send us an invite. Fairy ball, fairy ball. <laughs> Can't wait until someone recreates her dress there and we all see it. I also want to give Mira and her dress a shout out because pockets, the deep pockets would have sold me too, Mira. I had deep pockets for my matron of honor dress for Nicole's wedding. I love pockets so much, especially as a mom. They are so dang useful. Did you have anything in those pockets at my wedding? I was, I was a little distracted. I don't think I had any kid related things in there, but I did have tissues for at least during the ceremony and then probably my phone for the rest of the evening. Amazing. <laughs> I think you handed me a tissue at one point during the ceremony because I was unwell. Anyway, it wouldn't be an episode of Fantasy Fangirls if we didn't mention either Papa Sorengale's research or the Isle Kingdoms. And today it's the Isle Kingdoms is definitely the winner. So if the merchants believe that it is too dangerous to trade with poor Emil now, which is fair, can we assume that the Venon and Wyvern have not invaded the Isle Kingdoms? But I, if that's the case, why slash how? 
Venon have Wyvern to fly them over to the Isles. Why are they not touched? Like, why haven't they infiltrated those as well? Is there not enough, like, land or source material to channel from? I see it as why gather crumbs when the dinner feast is already right there. I believe the magic is primarily on the continent where the dragons and the griffins are or at least all of the magic is perceived to be on the continent. We have no idea what is going on in the Isles but I think that it is a very strong bet that the continent is primarily where the dragons and the griffins and therefore all of that raw magical power is so why would they need to go fly elsewhere when everything that the Venon needs is right here on the continent. We also learn more about Dakaris and how he collects people. Violet wonders that Zayden must think that he'll offer a deal that she can't refuse. My gut though tells me he's more worried about her being taken outside of any deal made with Dakaris. We know that there was a hefty ransom for Violet and these Griffin Flyers, they definitely want her dead. I believe that Zayden's been more focused on keeping her away for her literal safety than fear of her being tempted with Dakaris. I was today years old when I thought about this for the first time. <laughs> this is, that makes a lot more sense to me than him because like when they are negotiating with Takaris, Zayden has a hand on Violet's thigh because he's fucking recovering from watching her fight a venom but he grounds her because he's like rubbing her thigh as she's talking through the deal with Takaris. but at one point his hand stills almost like he's like waiting with bated breath of like are you going to take it are you not are you going to take it are you not But that rubbed me the wrong way always because Zayden knows Violet better than that. He knows she's not going to take the coward's way out. The offer that Dakaris gives her is, was, oh, that's it. Like, (laughs) like, you should have known better, my dude. Real quickly on that note, though, I think that's one of the things that I love is because what she desires most is for the people around her to be safe. She doesn't care so much about her own safety. I think we talked about that in a previous episode. And so therefore, Takaris can't get to her the way that he gets to other people because she is that selfless where she's like, well, yeah, I could do that, but that would be putting everyone else in Navarre and poor Mill and on the continent in mortal peril still like that's just safety for me and my friends and what about everybody else and he certainly cannot promise safety for everybody yeah except with the luminary that's like the best way that he can do that fucking coward i can't stand i think i've i think i've landed on the side of i don't like dakaris i think that this episode has (laughs) made me finally pick a side but cat Again, we're going to bring up God fucking damn it cat multiple times in this stretch of chapters. She is the worst kind of bitch. Just absolute bitch. It's like with how she plays with her mind, with the things that she says offhanded is like, oh, you should have worn a, a colored dress. Like, it's just like she is the worst kind of bully. Listen, we do not like to use this kind of language towards other women because men overuse it way too much when it's flat out not true. And it is one of my biggest pet peeves. However, this is one instance that I'm just going to say it. Cat is the definition of a crazy bitch, and especially the crazy ex-girlfriend. I feel like we all know that one girl who embodies this awful stereotype where it's like, how are you even a real person? And Nicole, you know exactly <laughs> who I'm thinking about. I knew someone exactly like this version of Kat. Not the weird, oh, do we like her Kat that we get at the end because she gives Violet a dagger and I guess that means they're all good again. But this exact version of Kat. I don't like using this language, but sometimes they really are just a crazy ex bitchy girlfriend and in this case Kat wins a gold medal for that I don't know how I'm gonna feel when we start talking about like a the smidgen bit of Kat's redemption arc but I will say I do think we are going to end this series on team Kat like at least I think that I am going to I'm just the way that I think her character arc is going I do really love these descriptions of seeing Kat's powers at work. Quote, an ugly insidious flame ignites in my stomach. Like how Kat works from bringing it from, you know, like let's say a 10 to like a 200. It is a really cool power. Like I think that this is a really cool thing to introduce to our story. Terrifying. I don't know how I feel about it, but I think it is really, really cool just from a storytelling perspective. But Lex, you brought up a really good point. Violet's shields are locked into place right now. 
So how on earth is Kat using her powers? It's like, would they be able to use their powers without shields? Can they even shield in the first place? Do they know what shields are? I don't know. Like like we were saying earlier, I, I believe shields don't affect them. Violet is able to block even Zeta now, but she can't block Kat out. And she doesn't understand how Kat got past them. But it's not just Kat who gets past her shields. There's Dakaris and the Truthsayer too when she interacts with them, which while we assume her shields are up at that time, I feel like this is a key mind work thing that will come into our story a little bit later as well based on how important shields continually are among the writers so that's the best answer I can give you right now based on the information that we have at hand I need to know more but we're gonna skip over that for now because this line is delicious Violet says to Kat quote are you capable of having a discussion that doesn't revolve around him meaning Zayden and Kat comes back with a list of things that are just like slap in the face slap in the face slap in the face that have nothing to do with a man or Zayden which means Kat would pass the Bechtel test what the hell is a Bechtel <laughs> test I'm sorry what did you, what what was that how did you just a, a, a Bechtel, a Bechtel, that sounds like rectal. (laughs) This is not a rectal test. This is a Bechtel (laughs) test. So this passage immediately made me think of this extremely popular movie slash media test. For those of you who don't know, like Lexi, it is not called the rectal test. It is called the Bechtel test. And it was created by graphic novelist Alison Bechtel. If you are a musical theater person like I am, yes, this is the same Alison Bechtel who is the subject of Fun Home, which fun fact was actually the last musical I ever did and is still one of my favorites to this day. Medium Alison will forever hold a place in my heart. The test itself is if two or more women in any book, movie, play tv show etc have a conversation that is more than five words that isn't about a man and I should say five words in conjunction in conjunction like together in a scene that is not about a man and if that happens two women or more in a movie book play tv show have a conversation that is more than five words about something that is not a man it passes the Bechtel test sounds super simple right it is actually incredibly hard for this test to be passed unfortunately especially movies of the 90s fun fact lord of the rings does not pass the bechtel test one person actually clipped all of the lord of the rings scenes if it was just two women talking to each other about something that isn't a man and it's from movie two and it's where's mama and then credits (laughs) that's it Wait, real quickly, Nicole, did you know that dad has been rereading Lord of the Rings because he's gotten all into fantasy because of what we've been doing? I had no idea. He just I did. finished it. And I was like, wait, really? Yeah, he told I me, he's that. like, yeah, I just finished Lord of the Rings. And I was like, you finit the trilogy? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, that's a feat, sir. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I love him. Shouts to you, dad. We love you. So this test was described as Alison Bechtel, the creator of the Bechtel test, as, quote, a little lesbian joke in an alternative feminist newspaper. But this quickly turned into a critical conversation when discussing gender representation in the media. So congratulations, Kat. You do pass the Bechtel test. I think this is the only time you do in the entire book. Don't quote me on that. But I just, I immediately, I was like, oh my gosh, did she put this in for the passing of the Bechtel test? And I hope she did. I learned something new today. I like that. You know, as I started preparing for this episode, I noted all the times that Kat said something bitchy and figured maybe we could turn it into a drinking game. Like I literally had like a special highlighter in my ebook and I was taking all of my notes for it. And oh my gosh, Nicole, we would be absolutely hammered. Like, like, not in a funny kind of way, but in a, oh my God, are they okay kind of way before <laughs> even our archives section. And I really don't want to spend this episode just repeating all of the hateful things that she spews because there's a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot that make me just want to punch her in the face. So we are not going to do this drinking game. We're very sorry, but we have to survive and give you the rest of the episode here. So just know that it is that bad. We will talk in our next episode about what Kat represents in the story. Rebecca has stated very very clearly that she is a feminist character who is after the crown and power. She talked about this a lot in a variety article, and we will discuss this a lot more with Kat and her character arc in later episodes. I personally have feelings about how well this came across. I think that Rebecca does really great with her character developments and arcs, but this is one character who I think that really did fall short in that way. But we're not ready to go there yet. Today, we're just soaking up Kat and all of her crazy bitchiness and collectively getting a major headache from her. But I am officially shipping either 
Mira and Drake, which is Serena and Kat's cousin, or Mira and Serena. So Drake's cousin is described as, quote, he likes women who might actually kill him. Sounds a lot like Mira, but she comes back with, too bad I don't go for Griffin Flyers. This just felt like foreshadowing. Now, whether that's Griffin Flyers as in Drake or Griffin Flyers as in Serena, I would die for Serena and Mira to be together. I think that that would just be so delicious. So delicious. Because they're also just both big sisters. And it's just like, oh. I know. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Like, I love Serena, especially in this sequence where she calls her little sister out for being an absolute wrench. And this, like, reluctant allies quarrel with Mira where it's like they they respect each other, but they're definitely enemies still. But now they kind of have to be, be frenemies. It's a really fun dynamic here. And, you know, then Serena even teases Violet a little bit like again they have this kind of great professional relationship and I just I love Serena and what she brings to every conversation she's part of I love that moment where Mira says I can kill just as easily as I can in a tunic and pants as a dress want to see we don't know where Mira is at the end of this book we'll do some speculating and some theories on all of that when we get to the end but I just want more Mira I just always I always want more of that big sister in our lives you know Obviously. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I have enough of you in my life, though. You're, you're <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love you. So our asshole alpha hole days are over for now with Zaddy. Thank God. Because this moment is perfect. Perfection. So Kat is infiltrating Violet's mind about he never gets flustered or loses control. And Violet starts believing her, which I'm like, girl, come on. You have many moments to counteract that line of thinking, but also Kat's fucking with her mind, so we can't blame her that much. But then he sends, just like he did with last year's Shall I Get the Wing Leader moment, he sends images of them fucking for the first time last year with like furniture exploding, daggers clattering, breaths shuddering, and him saying, I've never lost control like that. Bless you fucking, literally, Zayden for using this technique to calm our girl down and probably make her extremely horny just walking to dinner. I'm going to be honest. I have reread this stretch like four times, both between listening and actually reading. And I saw this in this outline and I was like, wait, what? And I like went back and reread it. It's like, I, how like I don't is it like missing in my ebook I don't know how I missed this even when I'm looking for it <laughs> <laughs> oh this shit lives rent free in my head on repeat <laughs> I don't know how I skipped over that part I understand that you have forgiven our zaddy but in the words of Riddick I'm still pretty pissed off Zayden says after his yes very good apology again I bravo him with that He says, now it's your turn. Can you admit that you should have waited for me to bring you so we could have formulated a plan? Zayden, that's literally what she's been trying to do for weeks, for weeks. And thankfully, Violet does hold her own against him there. But I read that and I was like, and that is why I'm still pretty pissed. I need someone to clip Lexi's face for just a second. Oh my God, that killed me. Oh, that was so funny. I do agree that this is not a moment. Like It's what he says in the dining room. It's possible to be angry with me while still being madly, uncontrollably, wildly in love with me. I do think that him apologizing and immediately taking the note of, shit, I have been acting like Dane. I have been really overprotective and not trusting her. Like we, again, in Fourth Wing, we talked endlessly about how Zayden would always let Violet be either at the side of him or in front of him to fight her own battles. Whereas Dane would always rip Violet behind him. And Zayden has been doing a lot of pulling Violet behind him in this book. And I think that this is the moment where he's like, whoa, no more. I can't do that anymore. And the fact that he hears her and he even says like, I heard you and I just think that's so good I'm so proud of him for that is a golden line right there gentlemen by the way I agree with you it was a great apology and he does great afterward but that one line I I'm glad that she stuck up for herself that's all I'll say is I'm glad she stuck up for herself because I do agree with you on that (laughs) it is time however to play another round of is it intrinsic or is it the bond Zayden noticing her emotions rising and Kat telling her he never loses control was this because he was reading her mind or Kat's mind because Violet even says he was too far away to have heard that conversation so but she has him blocked out via shield so maybe she shadows but it was far away it was really far away 
as it was kind of like rounding the corner, I, well, you know, I wondered if it was him reading Cat like in this moment, not even like when they were out in the hallway, but in this actual moment because she's still thinking about this phrase and she's conniving about how to mess their relationship up here. And I'm also under the impression that his intrinsic ability is limited by distance, right? He has to be near the person in some way shape or form to be able to read their minds however the way that violet does state did he hear her out there that's impossible that line right there is straight up foreshadowing which must mean that it is intrinsic so i am going to go with they were kind of rounding the corner a little bit so while he couldn't see them he could still i'll say feel their presence sense their presence and i do think that he was reading cat's intentions in that moment I agree. I agree completely. But Lexi, it is time to talk about one of your favorite sections of this chapter, and that is the 50 people sitting at Takaris's ornately decorated table. But before we get into this highly, highly awkward moment, are the people who are sitting at this table, who are they? Are they people that he's collected? Or are these people who are just like, over for dinner because they heard that Zayden, well, I don't know. They wouldn't have even heard that Zayden and Violet are going to be there. So these just like a normal Tuesday night. Well, so, so the people who he collects are primarily entertainers, storytellers, musicians, people along those lines. And then later on, when it does go down to just 10 people, he does say that they are nobles. So I am understanding that this crowd here is other poor male aristocrats and nobles, as well as high ranking military officials. Remember that Cliff Bain Academy and Zolia have been demolished or taken over by the Venon. And so they have all had to go to other parts of poor male for residence and quite a few ended up here with Dakaris. So I am sure that some of these people also came from Zolia too. Do you think any of them are Venon undercover? Oh, probably not. <laughs> I don't want to play that game right now. <laughs> okay, so we I just want to then paint a picture because 50 people are sitting down when the last four people, Kat, Serena, Mira, and Violet walk in. Zayden, as he's walking towards her, stares at her, doesn't speak out loud because they're speaking bond connection, mind to mind. And then at the same time, starts just absolutely devouring her face as he makes out with her. He puts up an entire wall of shadow for them to have a moment. Like, imagine these 50 people just like, oh, oh, <laughs> like, oh, okay. And I also want to point out, imagine Mira and Brennan's faces. Well, so so their shadows are up. So I don't think anybody else can like see exactly what's happening. But he puts the shadows up like right as he's starting to kiss her. So he's like leaning in and going in so for her. So it's obvious. And what it's obvious doing. what's happened. Yeah. Okay. Can I step up on my pedal stool oh, please. now? Please step up on your pedestal. Okay, let's step on up here. These two lovebirds have absolutely no concept of anyone else in the room, whether it's Violet's siblings or 50 strangers that Zayden has specifically said are Violet's enemies. I just, I can't with these two sometimes. They would be absolutely insufferable to be around. And I say all of this like in good fun because of course I love Zayden and Violet. And of course I love their love story. But no wonder Takaris is annoyed. I would be so annoyed if they were holding up dinner too and we're just standing there watching shadows knowing that these two are making out and making up in there. Like, so especially when there are tensions after Zayden broke it off with Takaris's niece. I, they are 20-something-year-olds. And I have to remember that sometimes. And this is such a cocky 23-year-old guy move to do where it's like, I'm horny and I'm going to make out with my girlfriend, even though my ex-girlfriend and her uncle, who I broke off an engagement with and I still really need with an alliance here. <sighs> These two, I just, I can't. If two people were holding me back from eating dinner, I would also be pretty pissed off. <laughs> like I get to Garza's anger. Well, they were also probably waiting for them because they had to get all dressed and all of that kind of stuff. This food has got to be getting cold. <laughs> Back in the kitchens where all of the collected people who are really, really amazing chefs are. Where it's like, okay, like, can we bring this out yet? Like, dinner's getting cold. It's like, oh, no, the shadows are up. Oh, man. Uh, what, what are they doing in there? I think they're making out. Like, You can really promise. tell where our priorities are in this episode where it's like, we want to eat dinner. <laughs> Not watch two 20 or something year olds make out. Now, speaking of Viscount Takaris and his little bit of pissiness, 
Did he just admit to wanting to wage war on Bezgayeth? He says about Violet splitting Bezgayeth down the middle. He says, quote, Bravo, been trying to take that place down for years, and you did it in what, six days? How was the Viscount trying to take down Bezgayeth? Or was he referring to poor Emil trying to take Bezgayeth down as like a whole? I had that question too. So poor Emil, the only way that I can see how he and poor Emil have been trying to take them out is by attacking outposts to take the alloy, the Griffin Flyers, you know, that means that they're threatening Navarre's ward's strength because the less alloy, the less powerful the wards. And when they take the alloy, that means that the wards cannot be as powerful there. So that would indirectly lead to their weaker defense, giving Takaris and poor Emil a possible opportunity to take Beskyeth down. But that's not really, that's not targeted or a direct approach whatsoever. They're not attacking the outposts to take down Navarre's wards. That's just a consequence of taking the alloy and poor Emil just doesn't care because it's like, well, fuck you. You have wards and we don't, so I don't care. I don't know. Like, you'd think that Zayden would be his main person on the inside when he's like, oh yeah, we've been trying to take them down. And it's like, okay, so they must have people on the inside. The only people I can think of who would be on the inside are Zayden and his peeps. And that's clearly not the case here. They are taking the weapons and that's not like taking the place down. That's just like supplying exactly. poor Emil. Exactly. That's what that's a whole other mission and goal in mind. I'm curious about how he's been doing that. And I wonder if maybe we'll learn a little bit more, but I kind of don't feel like we will. <laughs> I feel like this is the last, this is the only and last time we're going to be in court. And I feel like at some t- point in Battle Brief in book three, we're going to get a Venon have taken over Corden because like, Every single thing about the it's indefensible, it's to- it's totally fucked if Venon come and <laughs> Takaris knows it. I think that this is going to be a new Venon like pool party hangout after they take it over. This will be the vac- the Venon vacation yeah, home. They're, they're gonna get drunk and go swimming in the pool and go frolicking through the butterfly <laughs> gardens. <laughs> Or, I mean, he already has how, we don't even know how many stored in a fucking yes. arena. They're probably figuring out how to rise up and take over. Like, I don't think it's going to be any Venom coming to save them. I think it's going to be a coup from the inside. Good Lord. I, I actually do believe that. Yes, I actually, that is like actually what I think is going to happen. <laughs> oh, 100%. Absolutely. Like, there's yeah. just way too much foreshadowing of Takaris is fucked. Like, but I don't think we're ever going to go here again. Maybe. I don't think Takaris is going to be alive the next time we go here if we do he will probably be a venon or dead so speaking of venon though venon in takaris's house was not on my takaris's house bingo card and i was shocked when a venon came out of the ribosaw chest like that was what that was crazy me too like i i saw i read that and i was like oh whoa I kind of figured something different was going to happen, but I was not expecting a venom. But it does make sense that this is what Takaris wants Violet to do. He doesn't just want to see her wield lightning. He wants to see her kill a venom with lightning. You know, I wonder if Van Ryerson's chest, that was one of his most powerful possessions, had previously been used for venom trapping too. I have to wonder if Van Ryerson's chest, that was one of his most powerful and prized possessions, had previously been used for venom trapping. Just curious why it was considered one of Ryerson's most prized treasures. The runes carved into the thick doors, they must have multiple purposes. And one of them, of course, is to hover the venom inside. So as far as we know, the chest is still intact. We know that the venom did three throw the chest at Mira and Violet and Brennan there, the Soren Gales, but we don't get any other mention of it. So it could have been electrocuted since it was probably still on the ground there, but I don't believe that we get any confirmation that it is still intact or that it is not intact or whose possession that it's in. This might be one of those things that just like shows back up in our story and we're just like, oh, Cool. And the way that Zayden tried to walk away from the deal, I wonder if he was worried about what might be in the chest. You know, he must have known that it was more than just the chest. I don't think that he knew that it was going to be a venom inside since he was so shocked when that happened. You're like, violence! Meanwhile, Takaris, he doesn't argue about Mira joining Violet. I noticed that there. And I have to wonder, again, wondering when my wonder trains, if he was wanting her to die. If he's like, oh, all right, maybe I can kill off the famous famous Mira Sorengale here with this venom. So I thought that was interesting. I 100% think he wanted to kill off Violet and Mira so that he could get Zayden back with Kat. 
That was my headcanon. Oh. I just thought of it as a, well, he needs to see Violet wield this lightning and because he knows that she can kill Venom and he has to see it for himself. So it probably is a, that was his hope. But hey, if she dies in the process, that's not the worst thing that happens. And maybe not even like getting Cat back with Satan, but at least like a big fuck you. Like, oh, you broke my niece's heart. I'm going to break your heart as well or something like that I saw this as let me off the soaring gales basically I mean obviously you know he doesn't know that Brennan is a soaring gale so I'm kind of surprised that right. he let Brennan go down but maybe Brennan didn't really give him another option that's true I do think that the primary objective was for her to actually kill the venom for him to be able to see it for himself so that he actually knew what kind of defense she was able to provide before you know he went into his negotiations there but yeah I think that that would have been a very nice consequence <laughs> oh yeah for sure <laughs> one thing here to note about the venom the venom has distended red veins branching out from bloodshot eyes and he has maroon robes which from our previous episode does mean that he is a sage so sages have maroon robes and that is the description that, that we get from an epigraph that that is the kind of eyes that they have as well I'm not arguing the epigraph for sure the thing that just gives me pause is doesn't he say something about like how my sage will reward me when I bring you back to him no so we're actually going to get to that in a little bit that is what the venom wyvern writer said back in fourth wing he just says he so there is some up for question about who the he is is it a say we'll talk about this in a few moments here I don't want to get ahead of myself I will say I am extremely impressed with how Violet is able to keep her head on her shoulders in this moment. The last time she saw a Venon was when she was on the back of Taryn and she almost died like because of the fight at Resin. The PTSD that has been haunting her at Bezgaeth every freaking day has been a huge part of the story of part one. And the fact that she had a moment of flashback and then immediately gains her mental faculties is such a big moment for our girl taking control of her own mind again. Now, I do think a huge reason as to why she was able to center herself so quickly is because of Mira's presence and then obviously Brennan's presence and her feeling like she needed to protect them. I think that if it was just her down on the field, it would have been a little bit of a different story. But because she needed to protect her siblings and the ones she loved, she immediately was like, I need to get my shit together. There is a moment that made me pause, however, in the scene. The first strike of lightning hits the chest quote as though drawn to it how how did this happen how did this happen on the first try like I love our girl but she's not known for first try success (laughs) when it comes to lightning yet so was it the fucking runes on that thing was it the fact that there was energy in there from the venom but he's hungry like he's been hovering for who knows how long like yeah yeah why was it immediately drawn to the chest? So it has to be the runes that are placed in the chest. And that also okay, must right. be something to the effect of what makes this chest so priceless. So we know that runes, it's literally power imbued into an object. For instance, even Wyvern, what we see later on, when Wyvern are literally created with that same kind of power energy, the rune is a representation of that power and that energy. So we also know that Violet's conduit has very specific runes that Felix wove for her specifically to draw that power in. So this chest must be a vessel for power in some way and that is why her lightning is drawn to it. And again, it's very similar to how Violet kills the wyvern at the Cliffs of Draylor and it's even really similar to how she uses her conduit. That shit is delicious. I love, I can't wait to go to Rune's class next episode. I fucking love that scene. But in the meantime, we have to talk about the Venon's monologue. So the Venon, right after killing slash draining the life from one of the guards, which woof, gross, he says the following, quote, it's you, the one who commands the sky. If this sounds familiar, you are not crazy. Not only is this the same language that the Venon from the Battle of Resin used on the back of Tarn, but also it is the, quote, it was the third brother who commanded the sky to surrender its power. It's that damn fable, maybe prophecy strikes again. Strikes, ha 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 (laughs) ha. You're just on it with the puns today. I really I'm I'm a something today. It's, there's not a lot of spicy takes, so I got to get the puns in while I can and throw in a few others as well. But that language keeps showing up 
in our story. I'm really leaning into prophecy land. But if this is the prophecy, then who are the other two brothers? Because there's the Griffin brother, and then there's Dragon Rider brother, which is the third that who commands the sky, and then there's the Venom brother. So who would each of these mean? But also, if it is a prophecy, that does mean that at least hopefully our girl Violet would make it out of the series alive because it sounds to me at least like the prophecy is the person who kills the Venom creator. Yes, I have complicated feelings about the prophecy and whatnot. I think that it's a lot more tied to Andarna and Violet. And I don't know if it's so much of the three brothers prophecy, but rather as the person who comes in who can command the skies. And it's almost like that was the origin story of what is now the prophecy I'm still organizing my mental thoughts around all of that (laughs) I feel like we're not gonna know the full scale of it until book five like this is one of those things where we will still be confused until the very end and that and I'm okay with that a lot of people are like I need answers right now and I know that we are definitely people are like I need answers but it's all in joking because yes I want answers but this is part of the fun is it's like I don't please don't give me all of the answers in book three or book two I love how it's like things in book five are going to still tie things together from the book one and so when we do our reread of book one after we finish the series it's going to have a whole new meaning than it does right now and that's what I love about series like there's just something so delicious about not being able to binge everything right away like don't get me wrong I loved being able to binge Akatar just like boom but now that we're waiting on Akatar 6 It's like I have like all these theories and I have all these things that are going around in my head. Like same thing with this fandom as well. Like part of the fun is being able to talk to each other about what we think might happen. And if we were just able to binge all five books and then move on to the next thing, like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same. So I'm really glad that we like some people are like, I can't believe I found this book series that was unfinished. I'm actually really starting to lean into I love book series that are unfinished. I say that as I literally screamed into a pillow reading the end of Crescent City too last night so I say that (laughs) big old chunk of salt there but back to this world Violet fucking interrupts again this girl like look Lexi and I are big interrupters our whole family is and it's something we are working on but man it is annoying with Violet so Violet taunts the Venon about how he'll be rewarded by the sage to which the Venon replies which sage I promise you'll wish And then she fucking cuts him off with, for death? Remember, last year says, quote, you'll wish for death if I hand you over to my sage. But what was this Venon about to say? Or was he going to say the same thing? So this is really where I took his response of which sage as confirmation that it's actually the Venon general who is specifically after Violet. However, in Fourth Wing, the Asum that Violet does fight, she refers to her sage. It's probably the sage who is there and the one who haunts Violet's dreams. I kind of think of him as like middle management. <laughs> And, you know, we joke about how Colonel Ato's telling all of the assassins to make sure to tell Violet, you know, secrets die with those who keep them. And all I can picture here is the head Venon, like the general, showing all the other Venon students with a PowerPoint what he's going to do to Violet. And they're all like, oh, man, she's really going to wish for death after this <laughs> at, you know, Cliff Spain Academy and all of them. We're having fun here. <laughs> Oh my God. Like everyone shares a Google Drive. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that that really, that tickles me. That's so good. We do need to take a moment for our brilliant fucking woman defending her brilliant fucking woman title here because boy, oh boy, it's real. She notices that the venom had drained the field. And because of that, the water is now not going into the grass. It's just like pooling on the drained ground around them. She knows that the stone, this is amazing. She knows that the stone that created this pit that Takaris, like this arena that Takaris has made, was quarried from Bravik, knowing that this stone is from a region that has already been drained of its magic so it cannot be again which is good to know I guess that's that's new information for us so she waits for the venom to get closer she then throws two daggers to pin his boots to the ground which like good fucking aim girl especially with the rain and then Taryn lifts her up and just as he does that she strikes the water charging it and electrocuting the venom and then Taryn has the audacity to say you got it close <laughs> I absolutely love moments like this where she uses strategy and creativity to work with her environment and use it to her advantage. I just, I, Violet 
we're I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in this episode but man I love these kind of moments so much where she really puts her scribe mind her strategy and creativity to use but Lexi it is time to discuss some second signet possibilities because there are some ample haha ones in this stretch of chapters and we're going to talk about the two main ones from this chapter specifically so first up to bat is amplification this is a big old big old big old big old one in the fandom so what is this exactly it is basically what it sounds like the second signet is the ability to amplify others signets however different from a siphon this isn't siphoning their strength it's instead almost like a pulsating wave amplifying those around her so the arguments for it let's start there as she is walking down to the field she thinks about Andarna now Andarna is not with them in court and so this is important to remember but we'll get to that in a second but remember that Rebecca Yaros is a master at directing our focus and if Violet is going to be an amplifier and it's about to manifest in this moment directing us to think about Andarna right before it happens is a masterful thing to do in writing also Mira says this is as they're walking down to the field quote it's not like I have anything to do with her signet this would be another classic Rebecca Yaros thing to do to just like have that irony there. Violet is also touching her sister when Mira is able to create the wards. And we know from other signets that touch can be very important when using a signet. Now, it doesn't really happen in most of the other instances of the amplification argument for, but in this one in particular, it is very notable that all three siblings are huddled together. They're touching one another in a way of protection and Mira creates this ward around them. Yes, absolutely. And specifically because Andarna is not around, maybe that extra touch is that extra little zhush of power that she needs. So the last argument for this is the amplification second signet feels so fucking aligned with who Violet is at her core. She loves those around her and she is such a fucking giver and this is literally a giving signet. Now, just as we always do, let's talk about the argument against it. Number one, Andarna's fucking far away. She's a good several plus hours away from Corden, so it would be really hard for her to channel for the first time from Andarna with that distance being there. This also could not have anything to do with Andarna and her second signet and instead be an extension of Tarn and his signet. Remember, it is storming during this time and whenever it is storming, it is easier for Violet to wield. Now, this could be an extension of her pure energy signet, and the amplification is literally just that. It's pure energy, but being able to amplify those around her. And then last of the argument against this, in the opening epigraph for chapter 42, in this memorandum from Professor Carr to Lilith, it mentions how Mira, disappointingly, because it's Professor Carr, cannot produce her own wards without extreme emotional distress. If we are taking this epigraph at face value, value, Mira would be under extreme emotional distress in this moment. So it would make sense if this was actually her wielding. So that is second signet number one amplification. But there's another second signet that comes up in this discussion. And on our Patreon, we've started calling it Uno Reverse. <laughs> it's like that's the name for the signet that we've concocted. But what is this? It is the second signet theory that Violet for a brief moment can absorb someone else's signet and regurgitate it back. I almost think about it like Kirby in Super Smash Bros. You know how Kirby like like eats or like breathes everyone in and then poops them out and then she, like Kirby has their powers for a second. That's exactly how I think about this. Now, the cool part about this is it would be the opposite of Bodhi's signet. You can kind of argue that both of these are. Bodhi is the counteracting other signets. This would be absorbing other signets in this way. Now, this instance with Mira is just one of these moments where this Uno reverse signet is prominent. There's another one in next episode that in my opinion, is the biggest supporting factor for this theory. And I will talk about it at length during that time. But the argument for the Uno reverse signet. Mira says, quote, it's not like I have anything to do with her signet. We talked about this just a second ago. This would be extremely ironic because it wouldn't have to do with Mira wielding. It would be all fucking Violet. Also, back to that opening epigraph in chapter 42. Using this Professor Carr memorandum, it would be such typical Rebecca Yaros writing 
to bring up this inability of Mira's, making us think that it is actually Mira wielding, but psych, it is actually Violet in this moment. It's such, it's that dramatic irony that she's so, so, so good at. Those are the only arguments that I have for the second signet in this stretch. Again, I'm going to get into this one a lot more in next episode, but let's talk about the argument against it. Again, Andarna is fucking far away. She is multiple, multiple hours. Now, other than Andarna just being far away, if this was Violet wielding, why does Mira collapse? Because she's so fucking burned out from creating her own wards. Now, when Indarna gave her gifts, she was also exhausted. So maybe this is somewhat of the same thing. When Violet absorbs other people's signets, they're absolutely gutted for a minute. That wouldn't really make sense with my next episode theory, but that's just an idea that I have here. Or this also could just be Mira was attempting really, really hard, and that's why she almost collapsed, but it was actually Violet who did create this ward from her Uno reverse. So let's go into our thoughts on these two options of a second signet. I want to talk about amplification first, Lex. This is the front runner for me, not because it's my favorite by any means. My favorites are much more of like the talking to the dead. And I really like the Uno reverse signet. But this one feels the most logical. It feels very violet. It feels very violet at her core, lifting up others, helping up others. However, I really love this idea of it being an extension of her power signet. Again, totally throwing us off in true Rebecca Yaros fashion. I agree that this is absolutely the front runner second signet because there are multiple situations throughout the book where this would make sense. Now we have, you know, like for instance, like the dagger with Re. I, I don't think that that was an amplification for reasons that we gave back then but it is there, there's all sorts of breadcrumbs throughout part two here too where I think that it could really and truly work I really want this moment to be Mira achieving something on her own exactly like when Rhi was able to make the dagger go through the wall I want to celebrate these achievements as them making the seemingly impossible happen when they're under high pressure the ability to strengthen their power like this comes from them not Violet and I think that should be representative of their own signets like when they are highly distressed when they really need to make it work that is where they draw that power from like within themselves and they're able to achieve the impossible Mira does almost burn out here which makes me feel like she's doing this on her own I don't want it to be amplification not because I don't like it as a second signet but just because I feel like it dims the other people and what their achievements could be here I, I want it to be Mira making this happen on her own to your point Nicole I feel like amplifying others magic would be so representative of Violet at her core it's one of the this is really why I think that this is a front runner is because of how much it reflects Violet who she is at her core I think that this is the one that's a little bit more the opposite of Bodhi than the Uno reverse one. We know how nature likes all things in balance. Maybe we're getting set up that her second signet amplifies other signets when someone else we know actually counters them. I, I really like that that balance there. Now again why I'm not as crazy about this amplification one is because I personally really want her second signet to be representative of the scribe in her. I feel like that would be so poetic. I'm not saying that I would be disappointed if amplification is her second signet very much like I said with the talking to the dead as well because I do think that would be very badass and this in particular would be very very violent at her core I'm just saying that it's not this reader's personal favorite second signet possibility only because I want it to reflect her need for knowledge and information and for it to represent her dad when her lightning one represents her mom it's for that reason why I don't think it is, but I really want it to be talking to the dead. I think that we'll not get super deep into this one quite yet, but I do think that's another huge argument for distance wielding, but distance wielding in a time travel sense where like you're able to go back and talk to people or like bring people forward and all that kind of stuff, which I think is delicious. And I think that there's a lot of points that show, ooh, that definitely could be it. But again, we're not going to get super into that at this moment. But I agree with you completely, Lex. I want her second signet so badly to be so representative of that knowledge mind. And that's, again, why I really like the talking to the dead theory or distance wielding from not a apparating, so to speak, but more from a knowledge time wielding time. Yeah, like a distance in time sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's the talking to the dead. I know we talked about that in a few episodes ago. A lot of people referred to the Vanity article where Rebecca did say, you know, it, it, it could, she did confirm that Liam was a hallucination. We, we all know that, but she did not confirm whether Violet specifically brought him 
for whatever that reason might be. We, we, she, everything she said about Second Signet, she said, yes, it did manifest. Yes, you would know it. And stay tuned for book three. So a- anyway, I wanted to have that clarification there. I do love that she said, it was a separate article. I can't remember which one, but she's like, it. she didn't say it this in this way, but she said it something along the lines of, it's in your face. Like it's not hidden between the lines, which it drives me even more crazy because I'm like, well, which one? <laughs> like also how in your face like a like surface level in your face or like a how it would be in someone who who deep dives this book as much as we do in our face I don't know but let's talk about uno reverse I love this as a possible second segment but it does not give me Violet vibes this is taking something from someone else and it almost feels like the opposite of who Violet is at her core now if she's able to use it simultaneously with them almost standing in solidarity that feels much more violent to me but I like this one this one does feel very Rebecca Yaros to me like it, it we could all be wondering "Ooh, is it amplification Ooh, is it you know mind signet Ooh, is it da-da-da? and it's like oh psych it's all of the above because she's able to do literally anything anyone else can do but that that right there feels very violent is the ability to do whatever anyone else can do just as well. Yes, she has. This oh, chronic, that's true. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah. To your point, I believe that the strongest argument for this second signet possibility is in our next episode, because in this instance, again, I will say it. I really do feel like Mira is wielding the ward, especially with the way that she collapses, the way she burns out. She is clearly doing her absolute best. And I like to think that it really does pay off there. So I think we're both in the we're not convinced of either of these being her second signet yet I'm not convinced of any second signet <laughs> like that like I'm just not <laughs> same, I'm the same like I we're gonna do an entire second signet episode when we are done deep diving iron flame to just like lay them all out on the table literally how we've been doing with like pros cons all this kind of stuff and see where that goes from there but oh there's there's a lot there's a lot of possibilities in this book let me tell you moving away from second signet so I love this description of Takaris's dining room which previously had over 50 people in it but it now just has 10 including Kat Serena Takaris and a few generals and obviously a few aristocrats as well but everyone is unarmed except for Zayden and Violet and this is in addition to their signets which are both very weaponizing signets. This may be Takaris's home, but this is the amount of power that Zayden and Violet have as they enter this conversation over the luminary. I just, I love that. I love that show don't tell there. Now let's move into Takaris's deal though, because he says that his gift, remember they don't have signets, they have gifts, is being able to see what it is people want at their core. And Violet's is peace and safety for those she loves. If that's not a blaring second signet neon sign, by the way, I don't know what is like that. Right, like Rebecca Yar has literally just told us, "Hey, here's what she needs at her very core." So Takaris presents an offer for her to spend a few years as his guard dog, killing the riderless wyvern who are monitoring the area around Corden. We know from after the cliffs of Draylor, they're monitoring so that they can share the consciousness with the venom that who created them, and basically be spies. But in exchange for these, you know, few years of guard dog. She would live out the rest of her days with Zayden, both of their dragons, and all of her loved ones on the aisles. And Violet's like, that's cool, dude, but that's fucking impossible. Like, there's no way that that would happen. For many reasons, number one, like Violet notes, the Isles don't accept Navarians as visitors, which this feels like a promise for when we visit them later. I love that. But number two, she's also getting dreams from these Venon. They have wyverns. They are searching for Violet and Zayden. The Venon would 100% cross the sea to go snatch them up even if they were on the fucking Isle Kingdoms. Now this is also a major second signet clue for us as readers. Not of an actual signet manifesting, but Takaris is able to see what Violet wants at her core. Safety, protection for those she loves. Now the most, I'm going to say quote unquote obvious second signet of this would be wards, you know, being able to create wards, protect people around her, but we already have that through Mira. And I'm not going to lie, this would be Slightly anticlimactic if she was just another ward creator. Slightly. This would be wildly yes. anticlimactic if it was just <laughs> if it was her being able to create wards. Now this could mean for amplification for all the reasons that I listed earlier, but this also could be a, a hint of what she gets from her, you know, lightning pure energy power. Lightning does protect the ones that she loves because it is the only thing that can kill dark wielders. They're number one fucking enemy. But also, like I said earlier, if she's able to use her energy to amplify 
by others as well. This would also be fulfilling that core need, that core role. So this actually might be more highlighting her first signet deepest need more so than her second. There is also the theory that Violet's second signet is actually pure power and we're seeing the strength of her lightning wielding actually as her second signet manifested. So she has her lightning wielding and then her second signet is the pure power but it's so intertwined that it seems like it's just one signet. I'm personally of the mind that her signet from Taryn is this pure power and that is that much stronger than we ever could have imagined than you know quote unquote just lightning but that is another one of the theories that are floating out there. I feel like that one is so intertwined to the point where I'm like, oh, that might give us a headache. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that would just get too complicated. I mean, it's Rebecca Yaros. So I would not be surprised if she's able to explain it in this beautiful way that actually does make it make sense. But that feels too interconnected. You know what I mean? I agree. I really do hope that whatever her second signet is, that it does complement her lightning wielding and that they are able to work together in some way. I think that would be so cool, not only on the battlefield, but just kind of like how she does her day-to-day living. I do love the idea that her first signet from Taryn is that pure power and that is also a way of protecting the ones that she loves, which is exactly what she was doing when it did manifest, was she was protecting Liam and that is when the lightning came down and it was, you know, supposed to kill Jack. Don't get me started on that, which real quickly, side note, my husband just started a new job. Today is his first day. It's very exciting. And the other person that he started with, his name is Jack. And I was like, oh yeah, Jack fucking Barlow. And he's like, nobody would understand that reference. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so now that's what his new co-worker's name is to me. It's just JFB. JFB. <laughs> I do have a question though. Did they ever eat that meal that Takaris promised? I don't think they did because we would have gotten some descriptions of it. It kind of sounds like they could use the reliable meal delivery services of HelloFresh because that's been a game changer for my family. And I no longer have to worry about the dreaded question, what's for dinner? So whether you're looking to save money, eat better, stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef crafted recipes at the price you'll like delivered right to your front door. Seriously though, friends, my family is hands down a HelloFresh family. We have loved it for years. Same. We've used HelloFresh for years in this household. And as a stay at home slash working mom of two under two, I already make enough decisions all day, every day to the point where my head wants to explode. With HelloFresh, I don't have to stress about thinking of and grocery shopping for dinners and all those recipes because the hard work is already done for me. All that's left is to simply cook the dinner, which I actually really enjoy doing because that's my me time. Go to HelloFresh.com slash fantasy fangirl free and use code fantasy fangirl free for free breakfast for life one breakfast item per box while subscription is active that's free breakfast for life at hellofresh and they have good breakfasts y'all at hellofresh.com slash fantasy fangirl free with code fantasy fangirl free HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit and literally does save us time and brain power so we can focus on bringing more content to you. So while Nicole and I are not crazy about the Cliffs of Drailer chapters, we can appreciate two big things about it. Number one, getting to know Marin and surprisingly Sloan in a whole new way. And number two is learning about Griffins and their bonded flyers, which we are covering in today's archive section. First and foremost, I'd like to take a moment of appreciation for epigraphs like this that set up the chapters beautifully. Some give a bigger punch than others, and this one about how one path into Navarre is, quote, deadly to both Griffin and Flyer. Do not attempt under any circumstances, unquote. And then the chapter opens with our crew about to embark on this big hike. I just absolutely love when epigraphs just tee up the chapter so beautifully like this. I also love that they give us an elevation number for this hike. It is 12,000 feet. Now, here in Colorado, we have something called 14ers, which basically means a 14,000 foot hike that people wake up at like 3 a.m. to do and they end it about at you know midnight it's like it is a day hike I have never done one and to be honest I don't fucking plan on it I do love hiking but I like to do like my little Colorado wimpy hikes like anything over 
several thousand feet is just an absolute no-go. But since Rebecca Yaros is a Colorado lady, I do wonder if this was taken as inspiration, like those 14ers, 13ers, all that kind of stuff. That was exactly my thinking too. I was like, just us living in Colorado and being so familiar with mountains and hikes and elevation and high altitude. It's like, oh yeah, like you can tell that Rebecca really took some inspiration from also being a Colorado girl. Shouts to our Coloradans. Absolutely. And it also makes me wonder, because we're on, you know, our weird US based measuring system where this book is set in feet. For those of you who are on the metric system, does your book say feet or does it say meters, etc.? Oh. And can you let us know? Because I'm very curious. I'm curious about that too. Right? Because huh, like we know that in Harry Potter, they do change some of the vocabulary, like jumpers and sweaters and things like that. So I'm curious about that as well, about your versions, UK friends and everyone who is not the US because <laughs> everyone else is normal and we're not. All right. Before we zero in on our favorite second squad, I also want to call out what the luminary looks like. It is a vibrant blue ring made up of crystals, and it is almost as tall as Segale. It's been delivered to the New Forge at an offshoot of the valley above Arisha, where the dragons are. Because remember, you can only create alloy using a luminary with, and here's the key Navarian ingredient, dragon fire. So you got to keep the forge near the dragons for easy access. Hold on one second. Why was no one fucking pissed at Takaris for withholding this thing that could give them so many weapons. Yeah. Why was no one? Why was no one in Poor Emil absolutely fu- infuriated by this dude? Well, I was just because they're all that pissed off at Zayden and all of this that's happened. And that's what I think. Yeah. I think you're right, and honestly, that makes my respect for the Poor Emilians go down a few pegs. I'm not gonna lie, because that is just redi- to keep that like this is survival for them. See? You know what that reminds me of. That reminds me of how the revolution does not go to Navarre's aid at Samara initially because they don't want to help Navarian leadership. However, as Violet notes, by refusing the call, they are letting thousands, however many Navarre citizens die. And so that's what Violet's super hung up on is like, wait, aren't we trying to protect everybody on the continent? Like, why wouldn't we do that? And so I see a lot of that in this decision as well with refusing to give up the luminary, at least initially. It's based on petty squabbles, really. And it's not looking out for the greater good for everyone on the continent, and especially poor millions who need what the luminary provides. This is infuriating. I'm all for the Venom taking over Corden now. Like, this is infuriating. Whoa. <laughs> Now let's talk about the Griffin Flyers and Dragon Riders' first mission together. Hike the Cliffs of Draylor, which is about 12 hours uphill on a narrow path that was, up until very recently, booby-trapped. Nicole, what are your thoughts about Brennan's ideas at gaining mutual respect and trust with each other? Because I have some thoughts. My thoughts are, Brennan... Brennan is supposed to be a brilliant strategist, and I'm sorry, I have yet to fucking see this guy have an ounce of brilliant strategy in his belt. I agree on the end goal. Yes, definitely. They're going to need to fight together to defeat the enemy. That makes sense. But my guy, this is zero to six to 12,000. That is what this is. It is zero to 12,000. I also don't like that they're spinning this as like, this is your parapet. Like, I don't think that's smart. The Griffin Flyers would hear that and immediately get on the de- defense. Whereas the writers would see that and be like, oh, well, it's not for this reason. Da-da-da-da-da. I'm not going to lie. I think this is fucking harder than parapet. I think that this is harder than gauntlet because of the people and the Griffins who are climbing this experience. Not for the dragon riders because they're used to altitude. To your point about Brennan, because I agree that this was a huge oversight. I think that he's been away from Navarre for too long and he is just being extremely naive here. And he says that they need to learn some mutual respect and trust before they can be educated together. And like you, I wholeheartedly agree with this end goal. In theory, this would work fantastic like again in theory this is a great idea this is a great way to all hold hands and sing kumbaya together as well as for the griffin flyers to prove themselves but i don't think anyone is surprised that it goes the way that it does in fact i think it's actually went pretty damn well all things considered except luella dying that was very sad r.i.p and i do think that this idea originated again in theory because he has not been in navarre he has been working with poor meal he has been 
an ally of poor Emil for the past six years. And that is his reality. And now he's working with people where they were their enemies until literally a week ago. And he's just being very naive in looking at the whole picture there and everyone's perspectives. I wish that they had spun this more. They do a little bit, but I wish that they had spun it more as you are going to need to fight together. This is your first opportunity to learn how to work together rather than this is your version of this death trap. Like, I just think that immediately puts them on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Whereas if it was, hey, like, let's come together. And like Serena, I think, does a really good job. Yes. Serena's speech was 10 times better than Brennan. I, yes. I have feelings about my guy Brennan. I have yet to fall for Brennan. Like, I think that he, I don't like his character as much as I thought I would. Not to say that I, I don't agree. like him, but I don't love his character, you know? But the Griffins and their flyers, they needed to get up the cliff. So, like, I understand that dooming it alone would have been far too dangerous. Like, they needed someone to do it. So this was really their only option other than, you know, dragons, like, hoisting them up, which obviously dragons and griffins would never have allowed. But they should have spun the story differently. I think that this was their only option. I do see that as, like, oh, darn, what are we going to do? But they should have spun it totally differently. We'll say I appreciate what Brennan and the Assembly and whoever else is involved is trying to do here. Writers respect other writers. So here is a deadly prove yourself challenge for the Flyers. On the surface, it's a great strategy, like I said earlier, in theory. But there are centuries of hatred, fighting, and killing each other. Despite knowing that you have to team up to survive against the Dark Wielders together, I think that this is a shitty situation for most of these writers and flyers. I'll, I'm actually going to say especially the flyers. Like Serena says, they are risking the lives of their griffins, and therefore their own lives, to fight with people they thought was the enemy until last week. And I just really feel for the flyers here in this situation because they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. Except for Cap. Fuck you, Cap. <laughs> Speaking of Kat, once again, Marin won my heart when she showed that she is a good friend being disappointed for Kat, but she doesn't defend her friend and her actions. Marin simply acknowledges the situation from a new perspective. By being a decent person, she humanizes Kat like the tiniest, tiniest little bit, like the teeniest, tiniest bit. And I also simply love how Marin carries a conversation. I really enjoyed all of the dialogue that she was involved in. She ties in references that directly relate to the person she speaks with. She doesn't talk badly about her best friend, but she also doesn't sugarcoat the facts. I would really like Marin very much, both as a friend and as just somebody to hike up the mountain with. She has a great balance of sharing information and asking insightful questions. And I just, I really like her. I really loved how she carried her conversations. I really hope she shows up more in our story. And like, I hope that she wasn't just the bridge for us to start liking Kat. I also want to know what her gift is, if she has one. I want more Mirren. I hope we get more Mirren in the story. And then there's also Sloane, who is actually starting to grow on us. The way that she hates Kat just as much as Violet and us readers do, it's always great to bond with someone over a shared enemy. <laughs> I will say the way I cackled when Sloane gets like tail bitch slapped in the face by a griffin <laughs> like, it just, like that little line was so funny so funny because I grew up with horses and like that is a real thing where like the tail swish and if you're too close like it will just fuck you in the face <laughs> My hair does that to Brett all the time. Like if I'm like facing forward, he's like, hey, and like I turn around too quickly. I like whip him in the face on accident. He has, <laughs> he's gotten it so down where now he like puts a hand up to block. I'm, like, <laughs> Proud of him. Sloan brings life back for Liam here. And we see him just a tiny bit here on the pages. Certainly not in the same way that we did, you know, when he was a hallucination. But through Sloane's eyes, and I love that, you know, she's talking about how much Liam hated Cat too. Again, the fandom cheers, ah, huzzah, huzzah, and that no one could force him to do anything. What I would give to hear a Liam rant about Cat. You never heard Liam say a fucking bad thing about anyone. Like, I would give anything to hear him just go off on Cat. I miss him so much. I also hope that Violet can talk to the dead for many reasons, like I said earlier, but to hear her be able to summon Liam and then him go off about Cat would be just a delicious moment. My heart when Sloane says super quietly, I don't hate you. This is when we learn that Sloane has gotten to the October letters and she's learning how much Liam cared for Violet. Then when she says, I just wish Zayden had asked someone else. 
anyone else. Sloan won me over right then and there. This passage right here makes me want to read Fourth Wing all over again. Ugh. But what a great arc for Sloan, the side character, that is largely happening off page because we trust Liam and what his letters say to help Sloan in her development era. And this is only the beginning of what's in store for this character. But we had to get to this point right here to keep going as a united squad. And since we're discussing Sloan and, you know, her likability right now, do you think that she's going to make it out of this series alive? Part of me says yes, because we already lost one Mari, and I'd like to think that however things end up, that she is going to be, you know, her own Colonel Mari to really take after her mom. But I could also totally picture a scene where she's like, it's okay, because now I get to go see my brother again. So I'm I'm very torn between those two very specific scenes. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, I that mm, yep, that's that's a fair point. I think that she's going to be one of the lucky few who makes it out. I'm leaning towards that. I think that her and Arik are going of this year are going to be the two that make it out. Yes. But that makes me want to vomit. That's terrifying. <laughs> Let's talk about something a little bit less terrifying is the boulder falling moment. So the boulder a size of a feather tail is hurling itself down the cliffside and Violet attempts to use her lesser magic to move it. But then, of course, Taryn with his morning star tail just like, what the? Like, just like <laughs> obliterates it. But I love this inclusion because honestly, I totally forgot that they could move things with lesser magic. Now, why is this not used way more in this world? Because this is basically, it's not summoning like Re does. It's more like Accio, where it's like stuff in your line of sight, you can whoosh through the air and get to you rather than things blinking out of existence and reappearing in your hands like Rian and Signet is. That's the big difference there. But it did make me cackle when Taryn was like, quote, it would be a shame to have gone through last year just to have you kill us on a measly hike. <laughs> we also learn on this hike about how griffins and flyers bond. And wow, there's no death involved? What? So in the Variety article that we've mentioned upteenth times on this podcast, Rebecca said, quote, one of the points of Bezgayeth is that it is overly brutal. It shouldn't be that brutal. It is awful. And I want the writers to see that. They have to understand that the way they've been taught is not the only way. And something is wrong with asking those kids to cross that parapet. Something is wrong with asking them to die on the gauntlet. And something is wrong with how they've been trained. And you need the flyers in order to do that. I love this quote. I love this question that she answered on the Variety article because it we did need this. Like we talked endlessly in fourth wing. I wish I should say Lexi talked endlessly in fourth wing about the brutality of Bezgayeth and how it doesn't need to be this brutal. And now with our characters from Bezgayeth starting to broaden their horizon and learn like, oh, you can just like swim ashore and just like brush off an embarrassment and choose another line of service other than, you know, flying griffins. It's really cool to see them start to question this. And what that makes me wonder, what is Bezgayeth? because we know there's going to be a Bezgayeth because of Jacinia's opening, you know, to the story. What is Bezgayeth going to be like at the end of this five book series? Is it going to be the same brutality? Because I don't think so. It's going to be a lot more human because of this experience that they've now had with the Flyers. I absolutely agree with you. And we also have to consider the dragons. They are a big reason why Biscayeth does what it does because it represents being a dragon rider, really being hardened. You have to earn your place as a dragon rider and they absolutely take it too far. But the dragons are certainly involved in some capacity here. Not like, you know, like they're not helping them map out the gauntlet and all of that, but like with threshing. And so I, I just have to say that dragons are still dragons who will roast you if they're pissed off at you or they will let you fall if they don't think that you're worthy. So I agree that the system will change and we have to remember that dragons still have the final say when it comes to their bonded riders. It does make me wonder, like, are we going to have a parapet, a gauntlet? Like, what is thrashing going to be like? Are they going to encourage dragons to catch their riders if they fall like Taryn does? Or is that just you don't tell a dragon what to do because I'm leaning towards the latter. I just don't know. I, I, I have no idea. One of the other exciting things that does happen on this hike is that Arisha's first hatchling is here. Oh boy, it's so exciting. Wait a second. Oh shit, that's bad friends. Not long after the hatchling emerges from its little dragon egg and everyone feels the shift in magic just rippling from Arisha. I love that. Pulsating, Patrol- Lexi. The word is pulsating. <laughs> 
I'm calling it rippling because that's how I picture the magic. Patrol wyverns, they head their way. And now remember, these wyvern are being controlled by their venom creators. And there's foreshadowing of this when Violet reflects how brave the dragons are when they're flying through the intense fog so close to the cliffs. It's not dragons, folks. These wyvern do not feel or have their own agency. So they don't have the ability to even care that they're flying that close to the cliffs. I love those moments on a reread where it's like, I hear the beat of wings or stuff like that. Because every time you're like, is that a dragon or is that a wyvern? And normally I would argue that it's probably a wyvern. And it's just those little moments of foreshadowing. Oh, hey, this is something's coming. Something's coming. And you don't even realize it. It's so good. In Fourth Wing, if you remember, during their very first battle brief, it was discussed how griffins were infiltrating an outpost. And Violet was shocked because they don't normally attack at that high altitude. Friends, this is why like these griffins are looking rough right about now. And it's why Violet was so alarmed last year and why we got to see her have that brilliant fucking woman moment. Also, for those of you who do not know, altitude sickness fucking sucks. In fact, actually, when we lived in Chicago, whenever we'd come here to visit in in Colorado, especially for my husband who, you know, grew up in Texas and and Oklahoma, but (laughs) he would get like a little can of oxygen. And it's not like an inhaler necessarily, but it's these like cans of oxygen that they sell here in Colorado that you just like kind of like an inhaler put onto your mouth and then like, like take a really deep breath of oxygen. And honestly, they're great. I highly recommend if you've never been to Colorado and you're going to somewhere with high altitude, bring one. They're wonderful. So altitude sickness fucking sucks so like seeing this experience for these griffin riders and how exhausted they are and it's just like yeah absolutely like this makes all the sense it's not exaggerated folks it's real but our brilliant fucking woman is on it even through the exhaustion of this hike they reach that section guarded by dane which shouts to you dane that is a five to six foot leap plus a pressure plate on the other side and basically there's this rope that they need to cross and jump across in order to clear the pressure plate. And Violet thinks, quote, I never would have made it through gauntlet if I felt like this that day. This is yet another moment to tie in the brutality of Bezgaeth, but this time it's the brutality of, it's almost the brutality of Erasia. What they're doing is harder than both parapet and gauntlet, especially for those who are not used to the altitude. I will say the one difference, however, is this is absolutely necessary at least for the griffins and their flyers while the others you could absolutely argue were not necessary so it was unnecessary brutality while this is a suck it up buttercup so to speak Ooh, that's a great that's a great point now i will say they could have had people like Zayden who have those shadows to be able to like carry like a little cloud lift people up and da 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 da. But I love that moment where Violet's like, I don't really even know if he would be down for that or if he just let Luella fall, which like that's the <laughs> moment where it's like, ah, there's our morally gray man right there. But the fact that she also doesn't know is kind of like, oh, small red flag, small red flag. <laughs> We're just going to brush that under the rug. Now, Violet thinks to herself about Gauntlet, and during this reflection, she has the idea of the third ascent from the Gauntlet, which if you remember, it's these bars almost that are, or these rails that are uh, perpendicular to the cliff face, and you jump and you swing hand over hand from one to the other in order to get across. So Riddick climbs up, and I bu- I love that Riddick is just like a rock climb dude. Like that, <laughs> that checks. He would be. He, he would, would be. be. <laughs> he so is a rock climber dude. And he slams Dane's sword into the rock face basically creating a you know rail that they can then jump up and grab and swing across to the other side this is genius this is brilliant fucking woman stuff defending that title my girl in this moment however dane has a dece dude he's got a dece dude stretch here i think he's pretty decent dude throughout the whole book and we refuse to see it until part two. I'm going to pretend like you just said he's a dece dude in part two. <laughs> That's what I'm going to pretend <laughs> like you just said. As Violet is coming up with this gauntlet idea, he said, he meaning Dane says, what are you thinking? Don't tell me it's nothing. You have those little lines between your eyebrows. Then later, as Violet is working out her plan, but in, a, in very vague terms, Dane is right there with her and hands Riddick the better sword for swinging because the pommel is longer, despite her not having said anything out loud about the sword and the swinging 
happening yet. Now he says to her in this moment, quote, I still know how your mind works. I know that this is supposed to be very like, you're my, you know, you were my best friend for 15 years. Like I know how your mind works and like, like kind of connecting them again. It does come across slightly flirty to me. I don't know. What do you think? It almost no. feels like, oh, I might still have a shot. No, you don't think so? No, no. I think that later on in his conversation with her, when he asks if she and Zayden really are in love with one another, which she admits to him just in a few pages now, I think that it's just trying to call back that, yeah, they were best friends. They've had really bad blood over the last year and a half, but ultimately he does know her very well. And that's that's the only way that I saw it. I felt a small hint of, remember, Remember, I know you really well. That t- yeah, that because they're me. best friends. Yeah, like that. I don't yeah, think like, I agree with you on that. I don't think it was entirely innocently, but that's just me. <laughs> but unfortunately, our girl Luella triggers this booby trap and truly all hell breaks loose. Luella and Vicia both fall off the cliffside, but Sibylair grabs Vicia. Sibylair is Luella's griffin. Sibylair grabs Vicia, but Luella is held on to Violet through her shoulder, but her shoulder pops out of socket. For those of you who have never had a limb fall out of socket, it, it is like the extension of your limb is limp noodle. Like I, I haven't had a shoulder, but I had my knee fall out of socket. For those of you who listen to the AMA episode of that wild story of my life, but your limb is like hanging loosely and you can't control it. So it makes total sense that Violet's like, I can't do anything for her and it just breaks my freaking heart and then of course Riddick has two arrows this is so overlooked by the way I know two arrows piercing out of his side when I tell you I was about to raise hell because I thought Riddick was about to die I oh my god I it does make me wonder though I'm gonna ask the same question as I did about Sloan earlier do we think he's going to survive this series I'm telling you he has to survive to be the unlikely hero who takes out a big bad villain I am I am going to die on that hill. That is my silly hill that I'm going to die on. <laughs> honestly, I could see it. I could totally see it. I honestly don't know if he survives this series. My guess is going to be no. That's honestly my default answer for most people because I just need to shield my heart here. All of the foreshadowing about all four of us have to live to see graduation. I'm out of the four of them. I'm very, very concerned. I'm most concerned for Riddick. That's what I'll say. That makes me nauseous I hate that I think that's like a that's a Violet not making it out of it foreshadowing no I think that Violet's absolutely making it out of the series really even with the gravity yes Alrighty. interesting I don't have a I don't have my feet planted on one side or the other I'm very much standing on either side of the line right now with Zayden and Violet not making it out of the series alive but speaking of people who don't make it out of the series alive Luella <laughs> This makes me really sad because earlier in these chapters, Mirren says that it's hard to hate Luella. Like she's just this really likable, wonderful person who makes a really good butterscotch cake, which fuck me, that sounds delicious. It's Dylan all over again. We just met her and it's like, oh, we're so excited. You know, she's going to make cake and maybe she makes a good chocolate cake. So for Zayden and nope, she dies. Dylan. (laughs) R.I.P. Luella is the Violet of the Griffin Flyer squad, and I find the parallels between her and Violet to be just really sad. It shows how much Violet has grown in this past year and what her strengths are that ultimately set her apart from Luella. And then there's just how her Griffin dies, too, in the same way that Liam dies, showing the reality of these bonds with these winged magical creatures all over again. Well, until the wyvern goes and just bites his head off and and drags him right off the cliff. That was like, whoa! Like the quote, you have earned an honorable death. It was really another heartbreaking moment there. So, Well, and let's tie in another parallel between that death and Liam's death. Honorable. It's been my honor, which just rip my fucking heart out, why don't you? I love that all of this is going down with Kat being crazy as fuck, like telling Violet, like, you didn't save Luella and da 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 da. And Dane is like, I will throw you off a cliff, ma'am. <laughs> like, I will have no problem doing that. And Riddick is just in the corner with two arrows coming out of his side, like, I'm okay. <laughs> also, I just want to point out, and I might break some brains, and I apologize for this for people who are audiobook listeners. This is the point 
where Kat and Mirren start getting just slight British accents, <laughs> even though they hadn't had them previously. Just It starts to start here, and then it just goes unhinged for the rest of the book. Oh, it's bad. It's like, no wonder we all hate Kat. Like, what is this accent that she's got all of a sudden? My goodness gracious. It's Peter Baelish from Game of Thrones. <laughs> and please do not get me wrong. I love... Rebecca Solaire. I love her as an audiobook narrator. I think she actually might be one of my favorite audiobook narrators up there with Elizabeth Evans. But that choice right there, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, what happened? As they're talking about the plan for the Wyvern and what they're going to do, they mention that Sienna, who is a wind wielder, is that the same as air or is that different from air? I'm assuming that's different from air. I was wondering that as well. I'm going to assume that it is different. I'm like, if I had to guess, air wielder is higher up than wind wielder. I don't know. It, but the air wielder is like, you know, we know that like it can suck the air right out of your lungs. I don't think that a wind wielder would be able to do this. So maybe the wind wielder has a lot more power when it comes to the elements around them, while the air wielder is a little bit more about manipulating other kinds of... I, I think it's very nuanced. Again, we talked a lot about how there are different signets that kind of have the same end result, but there's different paths to get there. So I think that this might be a little bit one of those situations. I think you're 100% right. But Sienna, who is a wind wielder, her dragon's name is is Gaethal, which means wind. There Good you go. job. <laughs> Love how that happens. It is absolutely crazy how these encounters with Venon and Wyvern are becoming such a regular occurrence here. The Venon have certainly been busy creating all these Wyvern as they use them for patrol, especially as they continue working toward gaining more power. I initially wondered if the Venon somehow caused the fog to be the perfect cover for the Wyvern to go undetected. However, I'm leaning toward it just being the altitude as they get higher up and the Wyvern are able to take advantage of that in a way that the dragons are not because the wyvern they don't have to worry about being able to see through it because the venom are controlling them when violet goes to kill these wyvern once again she uses her scribe mind to be strategic about killing these wyvern we talked a lot in the last episode about how she is now curious about her power and exploring how to expand control and wield it this is the second time in this stretch of chapters where she doesn't think of her lightning bolts as flinging around boiling oil she's being smart about how how she wields her lightning. She's recognizing it as pure power versus just lightning bolts from the sky. Even though she's still stumbling in part two with decisions and emotions and such that reflect how Violet's world has indeed still turned upside down, she's starting to gain confidence in her signet that we really haven't seen before. And I just, I love that so much. She really needed this. She needed these two wins here in this stretch of chapters. And again, I'm just so excited for what's in store for her in the future. This shit is delicious like <laughs> delicious shit right here i love seeing this from violet so what does violet do she recognizes that wyvern are energy magnets because they are made from power quote i am power and power is me and then violet forces this released power down toward the wyvern i'm just like, like i like you can't see me but like it looks like i'm like banging on a piano right now as i <laughs> try to pretend like i'm wielding power down then the lightning branches out directly to the wyvern and zaps them. This is just so cool. This is another way of using her power that is now in her arsenal. And I just absolutely love it. Last thing to end this section of today's episode. I am honestly shocked. We, you Nicole, you mentioned this in Battle Brief, but I am absolutely shocked that Violet is not allowed to read all of the documentation they have on Venon that they received from Takaris, who had it from Cliffsbain when they were able to retrieve a lot of documentation about Venon from Cliffsbain Academy when they were running away for their lives. Has no one learned their lesson about keeping things from Violet. This is despicable. This is, Brennan is a brilliant strategist. Come on, dude. He showed this at the very beginning of the book when he was like, no, we need weapons. Meh. And Violet was like, we have a ward stone. Let's learn how to raise the wards. And he's like, no, we need weapons. Meh. And like Zayden was very similar. And now he's just continuing the shit, continuing on with his, no, let me not give this brilliant fucking woman all of the information that I can as she's learning how to raise the words. Let me instead just, that's above your 
great cadet or whatever. I just, d- despicable. This is despicable. So I understand that there are security clearances, but Violet has proven time and again that she knows more about Venom than any other writer. Remember that she is the one who told Brennan Wyvern are creative, not hatched. Just let her read these books, Brennan. Come on now. I'm so like, mad at him. I think I'm actually going to get more mad at him throughout the second half of this book. I think I'm just going to not end this book of Brennan Fenn. I, I will say, I think that there. this is also teeing us up for book three. I think that there is a reason that Violet and therefore us as readers are not given certain information yet because there is information about Venon in these books that is going to be absolutely critical moving forward with the whole Zayden is a Venon now. So I think that it is strategic on Rebecca's end for not sharing all of this information about the Venon with us and with Violet it. but it's just it's a stupid move on Brennan's part all the same <laughs> do you think he's still not gonna let her read these books and she's gonna do like another heist but it's a Brennan office heist next book because I could see it I like to think that Brennan has learned no I'm not even gonna say that I don't it depends on who else knows that Zayden is a venom. like I could honestly see Violet having to hide this from everybody else and that nobody else knows except her and therefore she is going to go on her own wild goose chase to find out more about venom to help Zayden well last thing before we move into our foreshadowing section as always our gravity counts this is any mention of Zayden and Violet together with gravity and there's only one mention in the stretch of chapters it is when Violet notices Zayden at the table at Viscount Takaris's house she finds him in under a second because quote he is the center of my gravity just gonna remind everyone we got that brilliant email from a listener that said the book of Brennan chapter epigraph earlier in this book that says it's normally gravity that kills us and this is now gravity count number five of this book There's that to haunt your nightmares. (laughs) All right. Now let's move on to foreshadowing. Of course, we talk a lot about foreshadowing in our previous section when we donned our signet powers. But of course, we always have to pull out other little foreshadowing nuggets. Let's kick it off with lots of foreshadowing with Zayden's end of book decision as he reiterates the lengths he'll go to protect Violet when they're in Corden. If I ever see a way to keep you safe, I'll take it. Well... Later, he sees turning Venom to be the only way to keep her safe, and he takes it. That episode will just be me weeping into a microphone of just like furious anger. Don't get me wrong. I still love it from a book telling's perspective, but I'm so mad at him for making that decision. Violet in Viscount Takaris' house describing the layers of her dress. If it were just one layer of Deverelli silk, it would have been see-through is what she reflects on. Well, Kat takes one out of this book and she wears a single layer Deverelli silk robe to Zayden's room one morning and Violet ends up answering the door, seeing basically a naked cat, I guess. <laughs> Takaris says that he'll tell them everything they need to know about capturing Venon, etc. It feels like foreshadowing of what's to come. Will our crew capture Venon and maybe interrogate them? Besides, you know, JFB, obviously, I mean, I'm talking like maybe a sage or, you know, one of those middle management (laughs) men in there. Zayden drops the word intentions again. He says that he did not have time to question every flyer about their intentions. Neon sign right here, folks. It'll be two more episodes before we cover this. But boy, oh boy, that word intentions comes up a lot more than I thought it did in this book. And now, friends, it is time for us to step into the archives, where each episode, Lexi educates us all on a prominent world-building topic from this stretch of chapters. And today's archives topic is griffins and flyers. Go figure, right? Let's talk about griffins first. They are half-eagle, half-lion, winged creatures. They have lion-like tails and razor-sharp talons with feathered chests, and they're, oh, approximately seven to eight feet tall. Griffins are poor meals equivalent to dragons, except they are definitely not as powerful or strong because, you know, dragons. Griffins channel power into their bonded flyers and can speak mind to mind with their flyer. And they can also speak mind to mind with dragons as well. They can all communicate together. Griffins cannot power wards the same way dragons were able to. Their magic, it doesn't work behind Navarre's wards. In response to the Great War 600 years ago, dragons claimed the western lands, Navarre, and Griffins the central ones, Boromil, and they all abandoned the barons, which is Venon territory. Griffins can fly up 
to 8,000 feet. The Cliffs of Draylor, as we've mentioned, are 12,000 feet in areas, making them unflyable for griffins. This is why it wasn't that big of a deal. Tirandor didn't have wards extended as far as high altitude places like Arisha. The perceived threat of griffins was practically non-existent, even without wards. And last but not least on griffins, a group of seven griffins is called a full drift. Now, there can also be a drift if there are more than like two or three griffins too, but a full drift is seven griffins. And then a little side note, the equivalent for dragons are riots. Now let's move on to griffin flyers. They go or did go to Cliffsbane Academy and they start when they are 21 years old, which is a year older than they do at Bisgaya. Cadets wear light brown slash tan leathers and after they graduate, they wear dark brown leathers. Their military drifts are divided into wings and they include, but are certainly not limited to, these are just the ones that I know about, summit wing drifts. So those drifts fly at higher altitude along the Espen range. And these drifts require griffins who are best suited for altitude. And then we have the sea wing drifts. They're best suited for lowland griffins who can't fly as high. The last kind of military drift group that we know about is the night wing drifts. They are located in the north along the Bravewick border and they are considered on the front lines. So you want to bond a griffin. Here's what you got to do, which side note, I would totally be a griffin flyer. I know they're not as powerful as dragons, but I would be fantastic at griffin flying. You walk to the edge of Cliff Spain and you look out over the river, which is about a 30 feet deep dive. And then you wait for the drifts to fly by. And when they approach, you jump. And if you land on a griffin and are able to climb into position and hold on, you bond. But don't worry if you miss and don't land on a griffin, you fall into the river and swim to shore. Then you pick another branch for service like infantry or artillery. Those are the two most popular ones. And guess what? There's no death, or at least mostly there's no death. I'm sure every now and then there's one. When a griffin and flyer bond, their lives become tethered to each other. So if the griffin dies, so does the flyer. But what's different from the dragon bonds is that if the flyer dies, so does the griffin. Remember, this is very rare with dragons. Violet and Terran are the exception to the rule. Griffin flyer powers. They specialize in mind work, possibly probably work against dragon rider shields. We talked a lot about that this episode. They don't consider these powers signets, but rather they call them gifts. Flyers, they don't define themselves by their gifts. They are strong with their lesser magic. It's like because griffin flyers don't have signets, they make up for it in their aptitude with lesser magic and their mind work. I just absolutely love that where they do kind of find their own version of even ground when they go head to head with a dragon rider. Griffins don't hold as much power as dragons, so there's more nuances to channeling power from your griffin. For instance, the Cliffsbane cadets don't dare try to channel from their griffins when the griffins need to focus on the climb. They are also unable to channel and then gradually get their power strength back while adjusting to high altitude. Like Kat couldn't use her mind gift against Violet until a few weeks later after her griffin recovered and got used to Arisha's elevation. There you have it. That's what we got here today on griffins, flyers, and all of their powers. Now, it is time to close out this episode with taking flight with our favorite moments. I love how Violet frequently uses size comparisons to the dragons that she knows best. This is on full display in the stretch of chapters, describing ceilings as tall as a gale, and the arena, the width of Tarn, and just so many tie-ins to Tarn and Segal and Andarna, and how she measures everything with those sizes. Tarn to Violet about Cat. Quote, It would be a pity to kill her now. I'm hunting 10 minutes away and I'd miss the show. What a bloodthirsty guy. I love it. I was a little bit surprised that Taryn was not closer to Violet knowing that she was going into enemy territory. I mean, I'm sure it's because Zayden was there and he trusted that Zayden would protect her. But like he could have been a little bit closer when that whole Venon thing happened. But anyway. It's called dramatic tension, Lexi. It's dramatic (laughs) tension. (laughs) You're right. You're right. When Violet and Zayden are sitting down for negotiations, Zayden has one hand on Violet and has had one hand on Violet since coming back from fighting the Venon. And Violet's like, nah, I get it. Quote, if I just watched him face down a Venon, I'd probably be in his fucking lap right now. I love that. And fair. I would as well, but for different reasons. I just want to <laughs> things up pretty often. Another instance of Taryn being sassy, Violet is moved by Serena's speech to the writers about how it would feel to risk the lives of their dragons in this way. But Taryn retorts back in a classic Taryn way with, quote, you did not bond the inferiority that are griffins. You bonded dragons. Take them for a walk and let them prove themselves. 
I love when Taryn saves the hikers from the incoming boulder and scolds Violet. Marin asks if that's normal and Violet responds with, which part, Taryn saving my ass or being grumpy about it? Because yes, both are normal. Yes, indeed, it is normal. When discussing the hilt of the sword, Violet says it's eight inches, but Dane corrects her to it's seven inches. And Marin says, quote, imagine a man actually shortening a girl's estimate. <laughs> and of course it's Dane. I was just going to say, of course it's Dane saying that. <laughs> Speaking of Dane, Dane trying to stop Violet saying, you're wounded. You know that, right? And Violet retorts back with telling him that he's a memory reader. And when he looks puzzled, she says, oh, were we not just stating obvious facts? Dane tries to stop Violet from going face to face with the wyvern right after he sets her shoulder. And he asks if Zayden would let her do it, thinking the answer would be a no and therefore proving his point. But Violet says yes, Zayden would, and that is why she loves him. Zayden took some major L's earlier in the stretch, as we have definitely talked about, but he agreed to her fighting the venom on her own, and that is reminiscent here. He says at some point he knows when to pick his fights with her. That is something Dane really could have learned in Fourth Wing. I hate the let her. Would Zayden let you? It's like, she is her own person sir last but not least violet seeks approval from taryn after her brilliant lightning maneuver in the sky against the wyvern and he says quote i chose you for that brilliance last year and now you'd like to be congratulated like it's something new and she retorts back with something like you're so hard to please it's so funny because it's not far off from something her mom would say actually in fact her mom has said something along those lines before but it's a very different relationship that she has with her mom and what she has with Taryn and it's much more acceptable with Taryn because of their connection because of their relationship than she has with her mom all right friends that is it for today's episode eight thank you so much for joining us as always we really appreciate you sticking through it to the end with us and next episode we will be covering chapters 45 through 51 it's going to be a bit of a longer stretch here throne scene baby (laughs) so excited (laughs) yes thank you as always to our executive producer hayden aka our sanity manager we truly don't know what we would do without you And like we said at the top of the episode, if you are interested in more Fantasy Fangirls content and want to connect even more with this community, please go ahead and join our Patreon party. You can find the link in the show notes. And if you're not following us on TikTok and Instagram, what are you doing? Go ahead and give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Also, please do not forget to rate and review the show. It takes two seconds to hit that five star button on whatever podcasting platform you are listening on or the like button button on YouTube. Also, while you're doing that, might as well hit subscribe while you're on YouTube or write a little review if you are listening on a podcast platform. For those who do not know, it is so helpful with helping us get the word out and helping other people find the show. Speaking of other people finding the show, don't forget to share this with your fellow Iron Flame listeners. There are people who hate cat as much as you and I do. And you know what? It's time to share our hatred together. That is what this is all. I'm just kidding. That's not what this is all about. (laughs) But please share this episode with your fellow Iron Flame friends. It is one of the reasons the show has grown so quickly, so rapidly. And we just appreciate every single person who shared or even shared on social media. You guys are awesome. All right. And with that, we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. I was so proud of myself for that little (laughs) shit. I I looked at that earlier and I was like, I didn't write that. (laughs) that. Idiocy? Idiocy? Idiocy. Idioticness. Stupidity. (laughs) Stupidity. And by... (laughs) But when a pulsating nice wave rushes over them... (laughs) Sorry, I've had coffee this morning. What am I saying? I need to look this up. Okay. What did you learn? That there are 198 results for chess. I think it's going to have a lot more of that humanization. Humanization? A lot more of that humaniz... Hum... Hum... I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) 